Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 239, featuring the first installment of a brand new interview series with none other than Chuckles himself. That's right, Mr. Chuck Boucher, right here on Matt Chat. In this uh, first part of the interview, we're going to talk about his early days uh, growing up with none other than Lord British, <laughs> Richard Garriott, uh, his high school friend in the, later in college. Uh, we talk about what got Chuck interested in game development and computers and his earliest games for the Apple II. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chuck Boucher. All right, folks, I am here with the great Chuckles, a.k.a. Chuck Boucher. He's the president of Craniac Entertainment, formerly the uh, game designer at Origin. He's a software developer of Auto, Auto Duel and 2400 AD. How are you today, Chuck? I'm doing great. Good morning. Uh, so I thought I would start off by uh, taking us all the way back to uh, the 80s or maybe even the, the late 70s and, and how you met uh, this character, Richard Garriott, a.k.a. Lord British. Oh, well, that is, uh, yeah, completely unrelated to computer games. We went to the same high school, and uh, I would hang out. There was a big gang. We would go, I don't know if it was 10 or 20 of us that would off and on hang out at his uh, house, and it started, I'm a little afraid to say, with Dungeons & Dragons at the Garriott place. And so uh, later, I ended up going to University of Texas, and Richard and I roomed together for a while, and uh, then later lived across the halls from each other in uh, for our apartments. So we hung out, um, you know. For, so you were doing the Ren Renaissance festivals and SCA, all that stuff. I didn't. Richard was into it. I had to learn how to defend myself with a uh, with a foil, but that was about the the greatest extent of my uh, involvement. <laughs> I got to say, I met a lot of his friends, but didn't do, I wasn't very active with the uh, SCA. So he gets the one that introduced you to games programming, or were you doing programming before? How did this programming come into it? I got started in high school. I, uh, as did Richard, he was, he was a, a little ahead of me a little bit, but uh, took a course in basic. Um, we, our, the entire class shared a single teletype machine with a paper tape reader. And uh, we would write our programs in basic, but uh, then going to school at uh, U mostly at UT, I was taking computer design, electrical engineering and computer design and um, got into computers that way. I am thinking Richard during our freshman year had to leave his computer at home. He couldn't bring it with him to school, but sophomore year he was able to bring it. it, it, it he was allowed to bring the computer up. And uh, he had released a Calabeth. Mm. It was all looking interesting. And uh, he says, Chuck, you should write a game. It's not hard. And so I actually wrote a, my first couple of games on his computer. And um, it was Apple II. It was Apple II. Yeah, yeah. And that's what got me started. That, I, I think the first effort, first work I did, before I did my own, I did some contract work for him. I did the space flight sequences in... Uh, Ultima One, and then I did did several of his uh, boot screens for the uh, later, uh, well, the early Ultimas. This must have been that, quite a high school experience to have all these. Or you, was, just, was it just you two doing all this game work, or were there uh, was part of a circle of friends? Oh no, it was just us. <laughs> there, there was there was no industry really. I mean, there were a few people that were dabbling and, and we brought some friends in ken arnold did some of the early music i don't know if he did a calabeth he did some music for me as well um it's kind of funny one of the guys that worked at the computer land store i ran into 10 years later in a college class it's like jim is that you <laughs> he says tuckles is that you couldn't believe it just randomly ran into him but no, there wasn't a lot of it uh, going on then. So, what were the other kids? What did the other kids in the class make of all this? Are they were you guys considered nerds, or was this considered cool? It was a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Now, now, as far as you mean in in the class, I mean, we we were off to college. Um, so this was this was nineteen. Uh, but you met in high school and then went to college. We met in high school. Yeah, okay. I wasn't doing the computer stuff in high school, though. Oh, okay, and, okay. Yeah. So we were kind of off on our own 
when the game stuff started going on. So you got treated a little bit like a nerd or <laughs> so Yeah, well, you know, some of that was justly so. <laughs> what was it like? Uh, I'll go go ahead. Uh, justly it, yeah, so. I mean, it's still computer. We were pro well. Richard always was more of a game designer. I guess that he, they didn't even have that term back then, computer nerd, right? But, oh yeah, they did. Oh, they did. <laughs> this is right away. <laughs> math science geek, or nerd, or yeah, yeah, it, it, definitely. Um, and and so, but but we always always going for us was that we were making computer games. It wasn't. Uh, it, 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 I guess the the stereotype the stereotype would be you literally a rocket scientist, particularly since he and I both he grew up more in the NASA area and I was going to the same school with uh, with the NASA kids and so yeah that that uh, it's not it, it didn't have the it wasn't the same situation then as it is today. <laughs> so what did your parents do? Oh gosh, my uh, mom was a housewife. My dad was a draftsman. He designed high level street lighting poles not and didn't finish his degree but they were very supportive of your, of your computer hobbies and yep yeah yeah uh, I kind of I, I got I guess hit the gates running coming out of high school and mom didn't worry about me too much <laughs> so you were roommates with Richard Gary at <laughs> yeah. That is, you know, what was that like? Did he make you? Did he make you uh, call him Lord British? Oh no, no, no. But we we had our shares of adventures. You know, back in the day, we did uh, quite a lot. We would go rappelling. We did rock climbing, rappelling. We did some uh, in Austin. Um, turns out that there are, are quite a few caves. That they're all very small, but they're close. They're like within the city limits, and so we'd go find whatever, ask around, find whatever caves we could find and, and go crawling around in those. Oh, wow. So you were a caver then? A little bit. A little huh. bit, yeah. Hope you never got, did you ever get into any predicaments with that? No predicaments. Although there was one that we would go in and it was always very, very tight to get into. And I don't think I ever made it in there. I, I would get up to the tightest point and have to have somebody go in, be in before me and pull me like six inches, and then I was okay. Then I was in. Well, I'll check so. you're a braver man than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> I don't know if I'd put myself through that again today. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, so I'm kind of imagined in this dorm room with, you know, cross swords, maybe some shields. I mean, <laughs> or was it, well, I mean, is it totally wrong? You guys were just really fastidious and, and focused on your studies. No, no, no. It was it was a little it, it was it, it, a little bit of both. Like I, I have to laugh because I can still remember. Um, I would set up. So we were, we were both studying uh, electrical engineering, and uh, I guess I probably was more of the mad scientist. Uh, he had he'd had the swords and the uh, shields. What I would do was take. Uh, I figured out that you could. Take, take the electromagnets. You could take apart a relay that had some really tightly wound electromagnets with really, really fine wire. You can wire up a relay as a buzzer, and you end up getting a really hot, uh, a shocking spark off of that relay. And I would take that wire on this really hair-thin wire, tie it to like a washer, and toss it across the room. And, of course, it would, like, drape over Richard. He's like... You know, because it, it, it's shocking him. Nothing, nothing terrible. But, uh, you know, there were stunts like that. Then I figured out, wait a minute, if we take this and wire it to one of the foils and we fence, you got a hot spot. It, it's wow. distributed through your hand. So the person holding either of the foils, you don't get a shock through your hand. You only get a shock through the point. So it added a whole different uh, dimension. I'm sure that must that must show up in some form in one of the Ultima games, right? Or... I don't think so. No, I don't think so. But it, it was cutting up stuff like that that, that uh, we would do. So at some point you founded your own company, Craniac Entertainment. When did you when did you do that? Craniac, I well, I've almost always been an independent contractor. I, I really only have had salaried positions maybe five years out of the last. 
is it 35 or so? Um, so there's always been, you know, for years and years, it was, it was, I, I don't even remember Boucher Entertainment or something, but I, uh, or, or no, Craniac, I did start as Craniac in the mid 90s. And I that actually. That does sound like a name a mad scientist would come up with. And that's exactly what I was going for. I, I, I'm proud to say that, uh, and I'm kind of surprised that if you think about it, I, I registered for the Craniac.com uh, domain in 1995 and, and there are not many people that have good snappy seven letter domain names that and so that's how long i was doing it it was since the early 90s under the craniac name and then i incorporated later in the in, i think 2005. let's talk about some of these early games that you did i have uh I'm not i'm pretty sure your first one was lunar leapers or was there one before that my first I had, I actually for years had the name wrong. My very first game was a game called Brain Teaser Boulevard. Which Brain it, Teaser Boulevard. Yes, Brain Teaser Boulevard. It apparently was published through California Pacific Computers Company, the same company that published a Calabath, I think. I can't remember if they did Ultima 1. I think they did Ultima 1 and then Ultima 2 was done, published by online. Anyway, I never saw that, that, that the, the owner of the company ran the company into the ground. And so I never saw a production copy of that. But wow. a couple of years ago, I got an email from somebody. They're saying, hey, I have this game. It says this by Chuckles. Is this yours? And I was really surprised. It's like, wow, it really is. And that's my game. And so it was... It was uh, so did he give you the copy or did you... <laughs> You had to buy it. <laughs> no, no. He was uh, pretty proud of that copy. And oh, sure. Claimed to be able to sell it for far more than I would pay for it. <laughs> uh, like $2,000 or something. like. He, he said, oh, I've got a collector that'll pay 1000 or $2,000 for this. I'm telling him, knock yourself out. So how does that make you feel to have, to be the, you know, <laughs> making these things that are considered priceless collectibles? Well, I think they're really only collectible, you know, in, in the grander scheme of things. It really, it was pretty, uh, I, I got to say. Uh, I mean, how, how old would you have been when you made that game? That, I would have been 22. 22, okay. Yeah. I was born in 60, so it's easy to figure all the, you know, we started Origin in 83, so I was 23. And uh, so I did, I, so I did all the, or, all the well, that game. And then there was Laugh Pack. With, that was my first package through uh, online systems. And that was a compilation of four games. Then we did Lunar Leapers. Did you do those, you, did you do those four games or did you just compile existing no, games? Oh, they, yeah. they were all yours. Yeah. So yeah. Was, that a, was that game a hit or that package a hit? I have to say, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't say there I think was. out of four games, one of them would have been good, right? Hey, well, I was making good enough money. It, 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 I, I have to say the the only the real success I had was Auto Duel. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, most of my other games could have been better. <laughs> could have had better sales. Well, let's get into those other games then. Uh, so you said uh, Brain Twister Boulevard. Was it Brain Twist? No, Brain Teaser. Brain Teaser Boulevard. Brain Teaser Boulevard. Frankly, then we. It was very Frogger esque. Okay. Um, then the Laugh Pack. Laugh Pack was four games there, good grief. One was a maze game. One of them, you actually used the little Paddles. controllers for the Apple II, and you would just fly ships from the bottom of the screen up to the top and dodge monsters. Uh, let me think. Another one was... These, are all, these are all before Lunar Leapers, right? These are all before Lunar Leapers, wow. yeah. Yeah. Um, can't even remember what the other one was. Apple Zap. A couple of them were similar to to arcade games out that were that, arcade games that were out at the time. Did you spend but, a lot of time at the arcades? Some, you know, I'm a child of the '70s, and that was one of the places to go and hang. Do you have um, any favorite games that you still play today? Nothing I play today. I always say it problem is I've never been uh, the skeleton in my closet. Usually is that for fun playing computer games is not usually my first pick. I enjoy making them. 
and I enjoy the technology and I, I enjoy programming, making things in general. But, but at the end of the day, I'm tired of programming and I want to do something else. <laughs> That's a good climb some mountains or <laughs> do some caving. Yeah, okay, crawl around in a cave. But I did. I always loved, uh, you know, I had some, I loved Defender, but I'm just terrible at it. So hmm. I think everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what about Lunar Leapers, this uh, shooter game in, in uh, 1981? How'd that come about? Lunar Leapers, I still remember I was trying to come up with a concept of something to do, and I just had this, I was in a class, this was at, uh, I think even Richard might have been in that, I, I can't even remember, this was at University of Houston, Clear Lake, I went through a lot of schools before I finally graduated in 11 years, but um, I, I had this idea of these monsters that would jump up and have long trailing legs behind them. And they, they, they were like, like jump just the way it turned out, jump up and try to grab your ship. And I just kind of filled things in from there. You know, we need a little more. And, and so added the various elements, but that, that was it. It just, I was trying to think of something kind of weird. <laughs> and we get creepy corridors in 1983, which was a Vic 20 game, right? A wizard of war style. Uh, no, Creepy Corridors is actually the maze game. Oh, okay. That was in uh, Laugh Pack. And I will say, I, if I'm not mistaken, I claim, ah, I used to say it was the second. It, it's the very, as far as I'm aware, the third Apple II game with recorded audio, with voice audio. The second being, of course, the original Castle Wolfenstein. And the first, which I would love to see, uh, is a game called Bloody Murder, which shipped, I think, with the Apple computer or the operating system or something. And it was very, very simple. You had two guys at the end of a bowling alley, and you, it was another game paddle game. And you would just move back and forth and throw knives at each other. And if somebody got hit with a knife, he would fall over and uh, some blood would come out. And he'd go, oh, you got me. <laughs> So but, did, you do, but, yeah. did you do the voice work for Creepy Quarters? Creepy Quarters, I recorded. I, I did all the, uh, back then, you know, there was no recording software. I had to write all the software to do the digital capture through the mic and then play it back through the speaker. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did all the sound effects for all of my games. And so, yes, those blood-curdling screams in the <laughs> corridors are mine. <laughs> you did your own blood-curdling screams. Yes, yes. I don't suppose uh, you'd be willing to, to do a modern version of that just uh, so we can compare. <laughs> By the way, all of this, uh, these sources and, and um, data files and archives, I just donated to the U University of Texas video game archive. Hmm. What was it kind of a... Yeah. Ah! That's what it was. It was just, ah! And that's all. <laughs> it, it, and I was... I was thrilled to see that those games still ran. ran. I, I, I donated my hardware equipment. It, it, I just moved from Austin back to San Francisco, where I'm hoping to stay for a while. And uh, I was thinking, you know, I keep moving all this stuff back and forth and back and forth. I need to just do something with it. So I donated all my hardware equipment, my communication cables. I, had, I made, It was all custom stuff to get the data from the Apple II to the Commodore 64 or Apple II to the Atari 800. That's moving forward a little bit when I was doing the ports, the Ultima mm -hmm. ports. But um, all of that stuff was custom, and I, I ended up yeah, donating it all to the uh, UT Video Game Archive. And I believe they have all of Richard's stuff as well. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's a very generous thing, you know, especially considering your games are selling for $800, right? No telling what that would have brought in. <laughs> yeah, well. For $2,000 for that one. <laughs> to someone apparently or allegedly what about this caverns of callisto game we've mentioned it before it's the little the side scrolling shooter with the jetpack guy right the ca caverns of callisto that was was that my first no lap pack was the first through online oh caverns that was the first origin game it, it's <laughs> see i get them all confused it's it, it, 20 30 years ago um yeah, caverns. We needed a, we needed something other than Ultima when we started Origin, and um, 
So I did Caverns of Callisto. I was really, in, in almost all the games I did, I tried to do something new. Um, so I'm very, very proud. It, you know, while the uh, sales could have been a bit, it, could have, it left a bit to be desired, I was really happy with all of them technically. And Caverns, um, there, I was really proud about the way we got the arbitrary 2D scrolling going on that, where you, you would fly around through the um, underground caves and collect things, basically. Um, yeah, and that was pretty much it. We had a bunch of uh, five different levels, I guess. It would all page off of the floppy disk as, as you need. It, it went from level to level, but that was kind of uh, normal those days. I also when Joe Garrity wrote in and said that he saw a copy of that one for eight hundred dollars last December. Really? On eBay, yeah. Really? Well, I have lots of those in the. I kept I kept my archive games. <laughs> I have lots of those around. Signed copy ought to bring in twice that amount. Auto duel with the original toolkits, all that. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the second installment of this interview with Chuckles. And believe me, guys, we're just starting to scratch the surface of this thing. A lot of great stuff coming up, so definitely want to stay tuned for that. Now, a couple of uh, news items. Uh, first is that 64-ounce uh, Games has uh, successfully uh, funded their Kickstarter goal, which was to make blind, uh, blind gamers or to give uh, blind gamers better access to card, table, and dice games. Uh, they're doing things like dice with braille on them, card sleeves, basically customizable uh, solutions for different games. It was really cool. Uh, they were only asking for $7,500 and they ended up with $20,000. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. It makes me feel a lot better about the games industry. I mean, we have some really good people uh, that are, you know, not just willing to uh, sort of pay lip service to the idea of accessibility, but putting their money where their mouth is. So. Uh, congratulations to 64 ounce games. Um, also, Christian Hallstrom uh, wrote in to tell me about a game called Diesel Stormers. This is another Kickstarter project uh, where medieval fantasy and diesel engines clash. It's a lot of emphasis on co op, which I really enjoy. Uh, so it looks pretty good. It looked like a pretty fun game to me, so I went ahead and pledged to it, and I'll share it with you guys in case you want to as well. Uh, also, uh, Age of Wonders 3, which I reviewed in the last episode, has just released or just received a huge patch. And I was looking at the patch notes. Haven't gotten to play it yet, but it looks like uh, just from looking at the patch notes that they have addressed a lot of the gameplay issues that I complained about in the review. So if you haven't played it in a while or you're still sitting on the fence, might be a good time now actually to uh, give it a go. Okay, I think that's all for the news. Um, as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys, if you have supported me. Remember, if you like to keep these uh, shows going, uh, please don't just expect everybody else to cover you. Uh, just take a few minutes, go to the Patreon link in the show notes. You can support the show at any amount of money that you feel comfortable with. It could be a dollar, uh, five dollars, ten dollars, or you could even step up to sponsor uh, the show. Anything that you're able to contribute, guys, I really Really, really appreciate it. I really do. You guys are awesome who are already supporting the show. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a little number called uh, Fresh Squeezed IPA. It's an India Pale Ale from Deschutes Brewery. And I've reviewed uh, quite a few of these of these of their brews. Uh, so, never been disappointed. They always do a pretty good job. Uh, this one's, uh, they're out of Bend, Oregon. Uh, let's see, this one's 6.4% uh, alcohol, so respectable, but not, not over the top. Uh, let's see, uh, heavy helping of citra and mosaic hops. Don't worry, no fruit was harmed in the making of this beer. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty fun thing there. Anyway, let's get this one open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this fresh squeezed IPA from the Deschutes Brewery. Ah, smells really nice. Actually, a lot of citrusy. A little citrus, kind of a... Uh, you can definitely smell the hops in this. I'm guessing this will be fairly bitter. But anyway, it smells really good. Let's give it a, let's give it a taste here. Let me try that again. I got really nothing but foam. You know, if you drink a lot of ale, you really need to have a mustache. So much extra flavor that way. Oh, uh, what does this one taste like? Kind of a uh, uh, 
chocolate to sort of a graham cracker like uh, quality to this actually. Uh, quite good. The bitterness is, is fairly subdued. It kind of tastes like a really uh, dry, bitter chocolate. If you like uh, those Belgian chocolates, which I know you do, <laughs> you know, let me give it another try. They're kind of a chocolatey almond like uh, flavors here. Maybe a little bit of a bourbon uh, quality. A really rich, uh, sophisticated, a little bit on the definitely, well, I'm going to say it's definitely a bit on the bitter side. Uh, so if you don't like that, you'd want to stay away. Uh, otherwise, well, I think we've got a winner here. Let me give it one more try. Yeah, just, you know, this is a really good, a really good IPA. It's just pretty much everything I look for in an IPA. A strong flavor. Uh, you can taste the alcohol, but it's not overpowering. It's a good mix of that chocolatey flavor and just enough bitterness to give it a bit of an edge uh, without ruining the flavor. So, I mean, they just really, really nailed it here. If you like IPAs, I don't see how you can go wrong with this one. I'm going to go full five out of five drinking horns. Uh, definitely one of the best IPAs I've had in quite a while. So, uh, good, uh, good job, Deschutes Brewery. Okay, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, the quotation I found this week uh, comes from Matt Smith. And if you don't know who that is, uh, you know, really, what the hell. Anyway, here's the quotation. I think that if the world were a bit more like Comic-Con, it would be a much better place. See you guys next week. Friday, say stone. Stone, Friday. Stone. What? No, 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 no. Stone. What? Listen, retarded. I don't know what you're trying to tell me, but we're not budging from this spot till you learn some words. A okay? Are you okay? No, idiot, stone! Are you okay?